if you have foot pain or heel pain, what many people call plantar fasciitis, uh, the treatments that you probably will hear about could be the worst thing you could ever do to not only get rid of that problem, but for foot health in general. We're going to find out more about that on today's episode of the Movement Movement Podcast, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about how to move efficiently, effectively, enjoyably, and to run, to play, to dance, to do all those things that bodies are meant to do. And we start everything with the feet because feet are your foundation. And we call it the Movement Movement because we are creating a movement about movement. We're trying to make natural movement the obvious, better, healthy choice the way natural food currently is. I am your host, Stephen Sashin, and from zeroshoes.com. And if you like what you hear here, or hell, even if you don't, just when you get a chance, go over to join the movementmovement.com. You can find all the past episodes, all the different ways you can interact with us. And of course, I'd love it if you subscribe and share and review and like and hit the bell if you're on YouTube and all those things you know how to do. As I like to say, if you want to be part of this tribe, please subscribe. And when I say the tribe, I mean this kind of literally because what's going to make natural movement a thing is a grassroots groundswell of activity, not just some big top-down thing from some giant corporations. Because frankly, they're the ones who are trying to make sure that you don't let your feet uh, and body move naturally because they've made a career out of doing the opposite of what we're going to be talking about today with my guest, Dr. Steve Ganjemi. Hello, Steve. How are you, man? Hello, Steven. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, I'll be the Steven. You be the Steve. That'll make life easier for everybody. And so um, uh, do me a huge favor. Tell people who the hell you are and what the hell you're doing here. Ah. <sighs> Um, so, as you said, my name is uh, Dr. Steve Ganjemi. I'm a chiropractic physician, holistic doctor out here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I've been practiced for going on 22 years. Um, I pretty much practice complementary sports medicine, in other words, like holistic treatments for our evaluation and treatments for uh, lots of people with athletic injuries from weekend warriors to kids to professional athletes of different calibers in different sports. And I s sort of run a family-based practice where I treat a lot of people with autoimmune conditions and hormonal imbalances, thyroid, steroid hormone, adrenal hormone issues, uh, a little bit of everything under the sun. Well, and since Chapel Hill is kind of like the boulder of North Carolina, um, mm. I imagine you also have people who like sprain a chakra or, you know, or pull yes. a eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not as bad as Asheville, North Carolina, which is about three <laughs> hours west out in the mountains. Pretty much anything goes there. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm smack dab, or, or I used to be. My office, I opened my new office about a year and a half ago and I'm closer to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill now where before wow. I was smack dab into Duke and UNC so it was more medical orientated but right. uh, yeah we still get so we're pretty open-minded here have we have we had the conversation that I went to Duke I didn't know that oh yeah I went to Duke and it was a long ago enough that basically between Durham and Chapel Hill the only thing that was there was the um, the Blue Cross building and um, mm. uh, what's the what's the was the only fancy hotel um, uh, the, the Sienna. No, no, no. It different or the one. Omni. It might have been called the Omni. Or the no, it definitely wasn't called the, the Omni. Whatever no. it was. It was uh, this one little fancy, fancy hotel that once a semester, we had enough money to go for their Sunday brunch. Okay. And, and we ate like we weren't going to eat for the rest of the week. Um, and what amazed me being in Boulder, which is another college town where everyone is way richer than we were back then, uh, you know, that's how people eat like every night here. But, you know, that was like a big deal for us to spend 25 bucks to eat as much as a college student could eat. And we, we ate that place out of house and home. It was a blast. Oh, there you go. Oh, there was another place. There was a jazz club called Stevens After All. Another Steven. It was a guy who realized that that the jazz musicians, they were going from D.C. to Atlanta and had nowhere to go in between. Mm -hmm. So we opened up a club um, just in that same, that same strip between Durham and Chapel Hill. And I performed tabletop magic. Uh, I worked for free and for tips. And he gave me a meal. And this was like a five-star restaurant. So I, I worked there twice a week and also ate well from that. Food is a theme in my life, apparently. Uh, and then every now and then I got to open for some of the acts. So I opened for like Etta James. And, and you uh, did magic? Yeah, I did magic. I can uh, picture you doing that. It was, uh, uh, I, well, I did, I was a street performer. And so I did a bunch of stuff at the Apple Chill. I don't know if that still exists, a big street fair in Chapel Hill. And then, uh, and then tabletop stuff mostly when I was, when I was a Steven. So I'm having Jeez. flashbacks. I never knew that about you. And I think we've known each other for maybe 10 or 15 years now. Yeah, it's not like I walk around, you know, handing out my CV to people. It's just, right. and, and it's a weird one. It's basically, it's the resume of someone who should have gotten Ritalin as a kid. <laughs> 
I was, I was too old for that. Um, in fact, how we, how we met, just to, to let people know, was we were basically just on a bunch of email threads with, with the people that I think of as the smart people in the barefoot natural movement or natural running game um, until we finally, finally had a chat. And there's a handful of people on that list that I've happily had uh, chat in the, on the podcast, uh, Mark Kukuzela, Irene Davis, et cetera. And so, and I thought of that, gr- that crowd as like the only smart people on the planet about movement and running. So uh, thrilled, thrilled to have you here. And now in a related note, um, you have a, your website is also a nickname that I think Mark gave you. Is that true? Um, actually, Mark's friend, a guy named who unfortunately has passed away, but started Triathlete Magazine back in the day, a guy named Bill Katowski. Oh who, man, uh, I, miss, I think I passed away a few terribly. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Bill was a good guy. And uh, yeah, he actually came up with a name just because one day we were talking about running and things like that. And at that time, I was only wearing socks in the office. I uh, kind of got rid of the shoes even in the winter. And uh, today, I actually don't wear anything in the office on my feet. It's completely bare because I was ruining socks and they were just too hot. So I, I kept the name the Sock Doc but uh, barefoot in the office and most of the day, just like you actually. Yeah, people, people find it entertaining when they walk in and half of our office is in zero shoes and the other half is walking around barefoot. Mm-hmm. And, and they go, wow, you guys are serious. Like, yeah, this is the real yeah. thing. Yeah, and it's funny because I mean, that's what my patients say too because we have a sign at our front door that says, you know, please leave your shoes out here or as you enter and if you want to keep them warm inside or keep, keep the spiders out. And yeah, we're a barefoot office in my oh, office. Oh, it would be even better if you had like a, like a wood burning stove or something. You said, please burn your shoes here. <laughs> be a thing to do it's something we've actually wanted to do um, a thing that i call swap your flop where you would come in with a pair of flip-flops or shoes and we put them in a giant meat grinder and take all the dust and you know the more we collect the more we donate to some worthy cause well, see, I, w- I always want to do that with orthotics like have a big orthotics meat grinder because you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you and i have you know gone after orthotics for years oh man um yeah yeah we, we'll, we'll get into that well, let, actually we will talk about that but before we do um since it is the movement movement podcast i always let us try and start although start usually means 15 minutes in or 20 minutes in when, with, with our conversations, but start with some movement, something that people who are listening or watching can do. Is there anything you can think of that you would like to share for the humans who are uh, part of our little conversation here? Yeah, well, um, so you and I, I mean, you, and, and just so everybody knows, you hit me with this like right away, so I haven't had more than a few seconds to think about oh, it. Well, yeah, just that's okay. Well, and just to let people know, uh, the amount of preparation that goes into doing having these conversations is as close to zero as humanly possible. Yes. So, uh, so yes, I gave you no warning right before we started 30 seconds earlier. I said, think of some movement thing that you'd like to share. And that's, and so, then- so here's what I'm going to share. Cause I'll just, I'll be able to do this standing up and okay. what I've been doing with people who have an imbalance, which most people do with their breathing diaphragm, which is up here by our chest. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people think their diaphragm is like below their ribs here, but diaphragm, I tell people it's kind of like bra level or nipple level. And it's a little bit higher up than what people think it's way up here. Interesting. Um, yeah. And, you know, when you breathe in, your diaphragm obviously descends, it goes towards your pelvic floor. And likewise, your pelvic diaphragm, which people still call the pelvic floor, both are accurate terms, should also descend. And then when you exhale, the pressure releases and your diaphragm comes back up and, and your pelvic diaphragm should basically correlate with that. So you should have a, a, a um, consistency between your pelvic diaphragm and your diaphragm diaphragm, your chest breathing diaphragm. When one goes up, the other one goes up and descends, descends. So as you breathe in, a lot of people's pelvic diaphragm doesn't correlate with their breathing diaphragm. And what somebody can do right now is just sort of stand up and see how much they can touch their toes um, without bending their knees and kind of get a pre and post here. Like how far can you go down and touch your toes or put your hands on the floor? Is it really weird to do it? Okay, so I'm keeping my legs straight and just bending over and touching my toes. Yeah, just like a, a straight leg. See how far you can bend forward. Like how far do your your fingers go towards you to your okay. shoes? I'm or moving, some people I'm, can put their hands flat. Uh, okay, so I've got I got my my palms end up about an inch off the ground. That's good. So what we're gonna do is basically we're gonna have people take their thumbs and put it on their navel here, yeah. and then drop their fingers to the top of their pubic bone. And your pelvic diaphragm pretty much starts like right in between there. So you're going to go halfway between your belly button and your pelvic diaphragm and your, um, and your pubic bone right around in here. So maybe an inch or so below your belly button, depending on your body type. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to push in like this. You're going to scoop down and in kind of like you're pushing almost towards your tailbone in the back of you. Yep. And as you take a deep breath in, you're going to push down and in and bend forward. 
like down to your heat down to your um, chest to knees again. So like you're just like what you just did, like you're yeah. gonna push down and go down. You're gonna flex your trunk forward oh, as you take a deep breath in. So it's three things. It's okay. push down and in, deep breath in through your nose, and then bend forward. So like a three second count. Lean forward, press in with ideally both fingers. And if you you might just be able to do one right and go as far as you can, like try and get your chest as close to your knees as you can, drop your head. So you're going all the way down and pushing in hard, you know, as long as it's comfortable, don't hurt yourself if you're, if you've got some gut pain or anything. And then as you come up, you scoop up and breathe out through your nose. So it's going to look push down and in. And then as you, and then as you come up, if you can see my fingers, then as you come up, you scoop up and breathe out. So you're basically going to do five of those. So you're going to breathe in, push in, go all the way down chest to your knees as much as you can. And as you come up, you breathe out through your nose and scoop back up and pull up. Ah, okay. okay. So it's down and towards yeah, yeah. the floor and then pull up like this. And you're basically going to do five of those. And after you do that, you're going to see how much further you can go towards the floor. So my experience with this is for whatever I, reason. I only, I only did two. I was right. using one hand do three I, more. But hold on, wait. Yeah, I just got my palms on the floor. So just from doing two? Yeah. So, so this is something I came up with about seven or eight months ago because my kids were making fun of me that I couldn't put my fingers on the floor. I, like I could barely touch my toes. So I did about five or six of these thinking, okay, I'm going to breathe. And I breathed in really hard. So when you breathe in hard, your diaphragm goes down, your pelvic diaphragm goes down. So I was pushing my pelvic diaphragm down as I flex forward. And then as you come up, you scoop up, you scoop up like this. And then like you're pulling towards your belly button and then you exhale always through your nose, in through your nose, out through your nose, and you stand back up. And basically after I did that, I literally put my palms on the floor. And the best thing about it is it didn't go away. Right. I mean, it's, it stayed for like several weeks. And even when it regressed a little bit, I never lost, I, I only lost like 10 or 15% so, of it. So since, since a lot of what, well, uh, let me try that in English. Since what many people think of as flexibility is actually just a neural pattern thing, your brain yeah. telling, you, telling you what you what it thinks your body can do. What do you think is happening here? What's getting reset? That because it's not create it's not creating flexibility. It's not making your muscles suddenly longer. It's obviously doing some neurological thing that allows this to happen. What do you think is happening? Well, well, let's say this way: it it is in a way creating flexibility. It depends how we use the word. It's not right. stretching anything out, right? But it is creating a flexibility due to creating more of a balance between the tension that is most likely there between the two diaphragms, right? So we're, we're basically neurologically resetting the, yeah. pa the diaphragmatic pattern. So when you breathe in, like maybe, maybe my diaphragm was doing this when I was breathing, my pelvic diaphragm wasn't descending. So mm -hmm. as I breathe in, maybe my, di my breathing diaphragm was coming down, but my pelvic diaphragm was stuck. And then as I exhale, they weren't coming. So I was resetting this pattern of breathe, breathing in, descend, uh, breathing out, Oops. pressure released, ascend. It would be interesting, uh, just for the sake of you know, being a dork and curious about these things, to do some sort of EMG, test electromyograph basically testing what your muscles are doing to see what's what muscles are turning on or off differently before and after this because um, yeah. i because there's definitely things maybe uh maybe piriformis maybe hip flexors maybe oh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff yeah and, and you know really when you get into your so as yeah so as iliacus yeah i mean you know and those deep what some people might remember the anatomy nerds like your gemelli uh, you know, your obturator muscles, even, but I, you know, your psoas is really a big link between your pelvic diaphragm yep. and your breathing diaphragm. A lot of people think of psoas as your hip flexors. The majority of it does attach to your lumbar spine, but actually your psoas fascial connections go up and wrap around to your diaphragm, what's called the, the crux of your diaphragm and actually wrap around where your esophagus and your diaphragm come together in the hiatus. So some people can actually have pelvic problems resulting in heartburn and reflux and stomach issues because of the imbalance between the two diaphragms. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I, I'm amazed at, at all the neurological uh, connections in your abdominal, everything in your abdominal cavity. And yeah. I say this because two weeks ago I had a massive kidney stone and the way it was refer, the pain that it was referring, where I was feeling it was so different than where things were actually going on. Mm. And I found that really, well, I'm now fascinating, then confusing and extraordinarily painful, but it's interesting to, to see how these things are. It reminds me, there's a friend of mine, a doctor named Tom Raven, who's a completely crazy, wonderful human being who does prolotherapy, where you're injecting, uh, where you're basically sticking needles into your um, ligaments and tendons to initiate a healing response. And he did, he, he treated me once 
Um, and I think it was working on my shoulder and I felt something go down my arm and I made some comment about him hitting a nerve. And he said, no, there's no nerves where I'm sticking a needle, but you have to think about it. When you were developing as a, going from a fetus to a person, yeah, embryologically, your, your yeah. fingers were basically coming out of your shoulder and then it turned into an arm. So there's something that's going on there that we haven't, we don't really know a whole lot about that's yeah. creating these sensations. Which yeah, is and, 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 and that's a very common issue, especially actually with people with sciatic pain. They think, oh, I'm, you're, I'm irritating my sciatic nerve by a pain in my hamstring or something like that. But a lot of times it's actually not your sciatic nerve or in your case, you felt like a, a nerve in your arm, but it's, it's that embryological origin. And the, the, the name for that is called sclerotogenous referred pain. It's, a, it's an embryologically referred pain pattern. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's, it's, it's really crazy to think about that because um, well, actually there's a, there's a very, uh, um, how do I want to put this one delicately? There, uh, there's a whole theory about why people have foot fetishes. This is not where I expected this conversation to go. And it's related, it's related to what you just said, because at some point your feet were coming out of your pelvis, okay, sure. right next to your genitals. And if you look on the brain map, uh, where your brain is receiving sensations, right next to your genitals is your feet. And so, and there was a guy who had um, uh, gangrene of his penis, and they had to amputate it, which is a crazy, horrible thought. And when you have some amputation, the nerves tend to remap and the nerves for his genitals remap to his toes. Yeah. And so uh, even putting on socks was apparently very erotic. Well, well I'll tell you a, a quick patient story is one time, <laughs> okay. so, sometimes it's crazy what women will tell me, especially, but she told me, I asked her, we we're talking about feet and calves and she wrote down on her sheet that her calves cramp. And usually for women, that means that their calves are cramping at night while they're sleeping. They wake up with, you know, this, this mass of locking up of their calves. She said, no, my calves cramp only when I orgasm. And the reason for that is because the sacral nerves that are linked to the genitals are all, also go right down to your calves and your feet. So people will get a foot or they can get a calf cramp during that experience because of the connection between Oh, the what two. a riot. So there you go. Very interesting. All right. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Hey. <laughs> There's your warm up. <laughs> <laughs> I like how we're both mildly red. Uh, so I want to back up and, and uh, take a whole different direction. So uh, backing up to your being in socks and then barefoot in your office. So how did how did the whole natural movement thing uh, come to you? How did you become aware of it? How did it, what was that that sort of you know come to aha whatever moment? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. You know, I always always ran in minimalist shoes when I started, I started doing Ironman races. I was always, I grew up as a triathlete, like even in high school, I started doing triathlon. So, you know, I'm 46 now. So this was a quarter century ago or so. Uh, and I always wore minimalist type shoes, you know, which people call like the waffle racers, right? The Nike waffle racers, that sort of thing. Well, when, that shoe, short, wait, wait, yeah. when, that, when that shoe came out, I mean, the first Nike waffle trainer came out, I was about 11 or 12. I remember putting that thing on. It was just magic because it was mm -hmm. A, so thin and B, it had a bunch of toe spring actually. But as a sprinter, when I leaned forward and it just put me on my toes, like that's okay. how I run. So yeah. yeah, people forget that the very earliest uh, running shoes were minimalist shoes and then that's it all right. broke loose. So I used, so I wasn't wearing the super minimals, but I was wearing like what people would wear, you know, maybe in a one or, or 800 meter or a 1600 meter race. I was wearing those at Ironman. Whenever I used to go get them at a, a local running store, people would freak out, you know, that was going to destroy my knees and, and that sort of thing. And I just felt so much better. And really I got into minimalist shoes strictly because I didn't have a lot of knowledge and there wasn't a lot of information out there in the late eighties, early nineties. I pretty much started wearing them because of the weight difference. People started right. talking a lot about that. Like, Hey, you know, if you can, if your shoes weigh X grams lighter, you're going to be carrying this much less weight and you can run faster. And that's all I cared about. So I just looked for lighter shoes. And then I realized, you know, in high school in my first couple of years of college in the early nineties, I had every injury under the sun. I had plantar fasciitis, iliac tibial band syndrome, shin splints, you know, you know, uh, anything, you know, knee pain, you, you name it. And, I soon realized after that, even though my training got smarter at the same time, where I just wasn't always doing hard, hard, high intensity miles, but uh, wearing the more minimalist shoes, I eventually resolved on my injuries, especially in my, in my crazy Ironman years where, you know, I did 20 Ironmans in my 15 years, I think it was, or 12 years. Wow. Uh, and I never had injuries at all since I started wearing minimalist shoes and during those Ironman years and even today. So I only got stronger. Um, you know, not, not to say I never had pain or I never had to take a day off just from training yeah. hard, but, but I recovered fast and I never had an injury that kept me out of a race. I never had an injury that kept me from prolonged training. 
it was more like, hey, you know, chill out because you're training too hard types of pains. Right. And, and so then, you know, and then a lot of the minimalist stuff started to come out, you know, later in the, in the 90s and early 2000s up until, you know, mid 2000s, 2010. And uh, yeah, so that's how, that's kind of how it evolved for me. And how did that interplay with the whole chiropractic training? Since most chiropractors get introduced yeah. to the idea of orthotics and posting the foot. Uh, in fact, tell me, I don't know if this is true. Um, this is something I heard from a friend of mine who went through physical therapy school. She said that the whole idea of building an orthotic to post the foot, to put it in a particular orientation was actually invented by a chiropractor who just pulled it out of his butt, totally made it up. And then it became a, you know, a, a way for a lot of doctors just to make a bunch of extra cash with an easy to do diagnostic tool or, or yeah, or, I, I don't know if that's the history behind it. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it, but I can't, I can't say that's true or not, but, but yeah, I mean, that's how, you know, we're trained. Um, um, I know even more so today, you know, than when I graduated 20 plus years ago, but, um, yeah. So, you know, it is kind of funny, like people come into your office, they're, most of them are wearing not so great shoes, especially women in high heels or, or right. you know, thick type shoes to make them a little bit taller. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is, the shoe industry. And, you know, then you do your corrections. For me, it's, you know, muscle testing, it's correcting muscle imbalances. It's, it's a lot of work. My appointments are an hour or, or so longer. And then, you know, why would you want to put them back in the same shoes that perhaps caused some or maybe even all of their dysfunction? Right. Especially if it's a foot, knee, back, or you can make the case for even a neck issue anywhere, anywhere in the body. So, you know, it's more of an education process now in my office where people know what good shoes are, what bad shoes are, and people come in. We, we do gait testing with the shoes on, various types of different muscle testing with shoes on to show people, hey, you know, this shoe is doing this to your gait. And sometimes it's actually because the shoes are literally not the correct size for them. Right. A lot of people don't even wear the correct size, but also... Um, you know, they're obviously wearing shoes that are over supportive, too cushionary, too thick. You know the deal. Well, so backing up to the chiropractic training thing, when they, when you were in school and they were talking about orthotics and posting the foot, were you just biting your tongue or were you, you know, making yourself obnoxious? Uh, neither at that time, because not that I ever got, I actually, so my, my story behind that is even when I was in high school, my senior year of high school, 1992, I had a good friend up in Massachusetts where I grew up. He was a physical therapist and he actually made or, old school orthotics. Those are the ones where they use the calcium and, and literally made like a cast of the foot. Right. And I started to learn how to do those at the time. I actually grew up in orthotics. I mean, I had them in my cycling shoes, every pair of running shoes. I thought, you know, a custom orthotic sounds so awesome. I mean, why would you not want a custom orthotic? Why would you not want something that can support your feet and help you run faster and support your body function in, in, in you know, daily and during race? So I, I never was without them unless I was barefoot at the beach. So I ate that whole story up. And then when I took orthotic classes in school, I started using them. But then that was about the same time. And, you know, we're talking late 90s, early 2000s, uh, where I started to sort of see the light and really see what they were doing and how they truly affected people. So I kind of got out of them professionally as, as I was getting them in them. So I really was never a big orthotic supporter. But at the same instance, I, I wasn't obnoxious at those classes because I really was still learning about them. Right. And, um, you know, like if patients came in with them, I really didn't give them a hard time at, at the time where today I do. Very few of my patients are still allowed to wear or at least recommended to wear the orthotics. I shouldn't even say recommended because I'm really, there, there's basically a group of people who, patients who I see, and I mean very small, I'm sure it's under a dozen, who they like the orthotics so much and I don't see them screwing up. I'm right. like, fine, if you want to leave it them, go ahead. Yeah. But for most people, the other 95%, they're only causing problems and they're no longer wearing the orthotics. So. Yeah, it, it's the, when people ask me about them, I say the simplest thing, I go, so we know that if you support any joint in your body, like if you put your arm in a cast, it gets weaker. Yep. Why would you think it's any different for your feet? And what that means for your feet is you lose the ability to do something simple like balance. And over time, what that leads to is something like what happened to my dad a few years ago, where he's shuffling down the hall, tripped on a little edge, fell down, broke his hip and was dead two weeks later. Yeah. And I'm not trying to put the fear of God into them, thinking that they're going to die from wearing orthotics. At the same time, I kind of am because, I mean, it really, it's just so amazing how if you walked into a doctor and said, you know, uh, my neck is bothering me. He said, oh, we're going to have to put you in a wrist brace for the rest of your life. It's like, or, 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 or a neck brace. I mean, that's, I, 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 use, I use like the cervical collar analogy all the time. Like oh, you yeah. know, if, you, if you hurt your neck and you, and you need to now let that heal up, go ahead and go in a cervical collar, but you're only going to go in that for a week a or while. so. 
Right. Yeah. But I like doing the thing where it's completely unrelated. So it's like, okay. you know, your neck put you in a wrist brace or the other way around. It's like, yeah. tell me how that makes any sense. And mm. yet, you know, but, but feet are such an interesting thing because it is our foundation. It is the connection. And so we do, there is a, an easy to mm, rationalize uh, metaphor or image of like, oh, we need to have some a supportive foundation. We need to really bolster that in some way. It's an easy story to tell, but yes. once you do any any amount of research, it falls apart. Uh, which and, 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 and you know what I'd like to add to that is, you know, we still hear all the time, like when people train, especially, um, you know, uh, athletically, musculoskeletal system, like think free weights and that sort of thing. People always want to talk about their core, right? Like how strong right. is your core? Let's work on your core. But, you know, there's a, there's a growing group of anatomists out there who I've taken some pretty high-end anatomy classes in Scotland in the past couple of years. And, and these anatomists feel that your core is really starting or is, or is pretty much your feet. Like mm -hmm. your core is your feet. And if you're not strengthening your true core, being grounded to the ground by strengthening your feet, you might as well forget about the rest. And, yeah. that's, and that's true not only if, if you're just trying to strengthen your feet, but literally if you're trying to strengthen your arms too. Yeah. Like, like your core is actually, or, or you can make the case that your core is actually your feet and not your glutes, abdominal region, you know, obliques. Oh, talk that. to, talk to power lifters, um, for the bench press, they say it all starts with your feet. That's yeah. That's good to know. There you go. Which is a crazy thing to think about when you're lying down on a bench, mm -hmm. trying to push something off of your chest, that, that movement, that movement is driven by your feet. And yet it is, yeah. which is, um, which is a fascinating thing. I, I'm not a power lifter, obviously, but I get a kick out of watching those guys and hearing how they're yeah. training because they're doing insane things. So one thing I want to transition, um, when people email me on a, and I get these emails on a very regular basis about plantar fasciitis, uh, I usually point them to your website because you've written some great articles and done some great Thank videos you. about that. And so, and like I said at the beginning of this, the, the treatments that are typically recommended for plantar fasciitis, from my perspective, are often the worst thing you could possibly do. Can you talk about how, you, you know, you kind of got hip to what plantar fasciitis is or isn't and the mm -hmm. treatments that you're recommending for dealing with that? Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about plantar fasciitis is actually going back to the anatomist is the anatomist, the anim, anatomist today will actually say there's no such thing as plantar fasciitis because there's actually no fascia in your, in the bottom of your foot. Now, some will say, yeah, there is some, there's 10 to 20%, but the amount of fascia that we think is truly in the bottom of your foot, this is a, you know, more just anatomically speaking, it's really not much, or some would say any to what we're all been taught. Really what is at the bottom of your foot is what's called aponeuroses. And these are basically the muscle extensions of all your calf muscles, you know, your right. tibialis posterior, your soleus, your gastroc, your peroneus fibularis muscles are called today. So think of the bottom of your foot as just one giant muscular sheath, right? And, you know, just like anything or a lot of injuries, when you have a problem in an area, typically it's either from proximal or distal, either somewhere else before or after where the injury is felt like there's some muscle imbalance there. And typically with plantar fasciitis issues, what I see is one of two muscles being affected and it's either your tibialis posterior, which goes from just behind your tibia bone, that bone right behind your kneecap or just below it all the way and, and kind of inserts and makes up the bottom of your foot, especially your medial longitudinal arch. I feel like people know it as your foot arch. And then the other one is, is your soleus, which is, right. you know, the lower part of your calf. Sometimes it can be your gastroc. But pretty much if you take your calf muscles, your gastroc soleus, more, more so your soleus and your tibialis posterior, and if there's some imbalance between one of those muscles or both, you're going to end up with pain distal to that, meaning down at the bottom right of your foot, either in the heel or in the arch or something like that. So really the treatment involves going back up the line in, in you know, behind the tibialis muscles or, or, or the, the lower leg bone. And looking for muscle imbalances between or, or in that area, in the calf and in the tibialis posterior. Well, on a, on a, two things. So I wish I could remember the name of the guy. There was someone who, who lives around here who used to do a whole presentation about plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. And he was showing some interesting MRI images where there was, as actually um, Mark Gazella likes to point out and Phil Maffetone likes to point out, that usually it's, a, it's not an itis. It's not an inflammation. It's an osis. It's, it's an like osis, yeah. yeah. But, exactly. um, but he is showing, you know, some problems with the tissue in the foot. But like you said, I mean, 80% of the time when someone tells me they have plantar fasciitis, I can just look at them and I can spot where there's something going on typically in their, at the bottom of their calf, you stick yep. your finger in there and they fall to their knees. And I go, go roll the crap out of that. Go yep. work on that and tell me how you feel. And yep. then usually five minutes later, it's like, wow, it's 80% better. And so exactly. it amazes me the number of people who 
get misdiagnosed because for whatever reason, the medical practitioner they're seeing just, I, I don't know what it is. They just take it all at face value. I, met, I, I, I had this twice happen where I met someone or knew someone who said, well, I love your shoes, but I can't wear them because I have plantar fasciitis or I'm, and I'm having surgery coming up soon. And I look at them, I go, well, um, I don't think you have plantar fasciitis. And they go, what? I go, can you stand on your toes? And they go, yeah. I go, if you really had plantar fasciitis, you couldn't do that. I said, can you just like bounce back and forth from one foot to the other while staying on your toes? They go, yeah. I said, does that hurt? They go, no. I said, yeah, if you really had plantar fasciitis, you couldn't do that. I said, lean forward while you're doing that bouncing back and forth thing. And then suddenly they're running pain-free. And what amazes me is both of them still went and had surgery anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and, yeah. and look, I get and, it. And, and, and then unfortunately with surgery, you know, to, to get to that area where the surgery has felt like it's needed, you're cutting through some pretty right. significant tissue. You know, you, you are really creating a giant fascial lesion in there you're creating a new injury which people right. don't realize and so so you've distorted you've created tissue a, a, a dysmorphology you know you you've, you've created tissue problems more so than what you already had i think we need to have i think it's a new villain for uh, the avengers who's dysmorphia I don't, I don't know what his i don't know what his power is but i just like to i like dysmorphology it's just injuring people that's it Oh, that could be it, uh, but not, <laughs> in, in a way that's different than what it looks like. That's what it has to be. That's what, yeah. that's what dysmorphia does. It's yeah. like, I have this pain right here. Yeah, but it's your foot. Yeah, but it hurts right here. So and that's just, you know, I always tell people, and I think like you do too, is your feet and, and foot symptoms, plantar fasciitis would probably be at the top of my list. Maybe Achilles tendonitis a close second. And there are, there are a lot of times related to the soleus issues, lower calf issues. Um, you know, your feet are a great reflection of your overall health. So people tend to think, hey, plantar fasciitis is a running problem. It's, it's you're putting in too many miles, you're not recovering well. But you know, I see people don't run at all. And it's just yeah. because they're under too much stress, they're, they're not eating well, they're working too much, they're not sleeping well. And your, your feet are such a great reflection of your overall health. I tell my patients and, and, and people, you know, how do your feet feel first thing in the morning when you get out of bed? Are they supple? Could, could, you, could you get up and run out, run out of your house if you had to? Or would you be, feel like you're walking on eggshells and you're like, ah, and I gotta like loosen my feet, I gotta stretch them out? Because that's a great, a oh, great indication of your overall health and how well you slept. I mean, we've all had, I have one I've trained you hard, you know, you get up one morning, you're like, man, my feet are kind of achy or I got this, you know, a little uh, you know, sharp pain here in my heel or my, my toe, things aren't moving as well as they should. And it's, you know, it's telling you, you got to chill out or you're pushing yourself too hard. So you got to, you got to listen to your feet, right? Well, as a competitive sprinter, I have a different answer, which is I could roll out of bed and I could run, but I'd really like to do some warm ups and drills first because otherwise I won't be running as fast as I can. And I'm, you know, 57 you years old and he's a little, I mean, a little warming out. Actually, it's funny. Um, um, I, I, I was visiting my sister and I have a nephew. He's 20 now, but I think this is when he was about 17. He's a pretty good athlete. And we just woke up and I made some comment about going to the track and he said, I'll race you. I said, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. He's, why not? I said, well, because there's no upside for you. Either you're going to win or lose to a really old guy. <laughs> did, so did you race him? No, he, he no. realized that it wasn't a good idea and that I would probably yeah. crush him. So <laughs> 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 it happens every now and then. It's my favorite thing at high school track meets um, is uh, I'll, 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 if there's an open track meet, I'll go race it because they have uh, a lot of what, what, what were you first under hundreds? Yeah. Or yeah. indoor or the 50 or 60, depending on the track. And yeah. so I'll, I'll beat a lot of the high school kids. And it's one of my favorite things to do. It's, I don't do it to be obnoxious, but it is obnoxious. I'll walk up to him and go, hey, just so you know, um, I'm older than your dad. And I, <laughs> and I do it just to see how they react because the ones who get depressed, it, it's sort of, it's kind of disappointing. Um, but the yeah. ones who, who like get really mad and they want to beat me, I like to hang out with these kids and, and train with them and work with them because yeah. I, I know I've just put a target on my back that's going to be good for them. It'll be motivating. Yeah. And, they're, and they're really fun because you know, that's how I was. I was stupidly competitive in high school and it's fun yeah. to hang out with those kids. Cool. Yeah. So, so um, when someone comes in, they're presenting something that they're thinking is plantar fasciitis. And maybe let's say, again, maybe it, it is something that really is going on. Let's use the phrase plantar fascia to refer sure, to the bottom sure. of the foot. What are the yeah. things that you do or what are the things that you can help people who are dealing with this to do? That, or let's actually, let's go back to the very beginning of the show. What are the typical treatments that you know about that most people do that don't work and why? And then what do you do that does and why? So, so definitely one of the most common ones is, you know, people have orthotics, they were put in them months, years ago, and they're still wearing them today. And unfortunately, now they've weakened their feet so poor, so bad that they can't be without their orthotics. You know, so I have some people like, they'll say to me, you know, I can't take my shoes off in your office, because I literally cannot walk from 
you know, the, the 50 feet from the entrance to back to your room. Cause my no, feet the, are the, really the one, the one that I hear, I ask people, can you, how is it walking barefoot in your house? And they'll say this, they'll say, they'll say the phrase, I have hardwood floors. Yeah, they say, I have alligators, piranhas, and cactus for floors. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, all my floors are hardwood. So right. People, the floor is too hard for people and their, their feet have just weakened so poorly. So that, um, you know, shockwave therapy, therapy, unfortunately has gotten popular, you know, where they just go in there. And I know that I've never seen someone do it, but I've heard patients tell me about it where it's super painful and they're just trying to break up adhesions in there. Usually only oh, at the bottom of the foot. The, th the thing with the, um, with the, um, uh, whatever it's called, it's a piezoelectric. It's basically, yeah. it just sends a giant spike of something. I've never had yeah. them do it to my, wait, have I had them do it to my foot? I've done it. I've had them do that to my shoulder. And yeah, it, it's the weirdest sensation. It feels like someone just, some tiny little person just punched you inside your body. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really unpleasant. And it really like created a whole lot of movement. It was super cool. In fact, mm -hmm. I'm going to be at an event this weekend where uh, there's someone who, who that's their device that they sell and they're going to be demoing. I'm going to have them, you know, beat up my shoulder. I'm, I'm two years out of shoulder surgery and any little thing. I mean, I'm, I'm just a dork for that. So yeah, it's fascinating, but definitely uh, not the most pleasant thing to go through. Yeah. And you know, every now and then when, then I think somebody gets lucky and it happens to break up the one adhesion that was there and is causing a plantar flush fascia, but usually it's not addressing the issue at all. Right. Um, and obviously ultrasounds is really big and taping and, you know, uh, cortisone shots of course are still pretty common. Right. Have you, have you, have you looked at a sky mall catalog in the last couple of years? Oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. there's usually yeah. like five or six shoes that basically immobilize your foot that are advertised as a cure. Or the, um, I forget the name of the sock off the top of my head, but that sock that keeps your foot dorsiflexed when you sleep at yeah, night, yeah. you know, pulls hold, it back. Look, hold on. There's, there's, a, sock or something. there's a woman, I don't know if she's, I don't remember what kind of metal, medical practitioner she is, but she's selling a sandal that uh, she claims, well, she says there's a study that shows that it reduces the, the effects of plantar fasciitis or, or eliminates the symptoms or cures plantar fasciitis, she might even say. And the mm -hmm. study was basically just um, people self-reporting what it is to, to wear this sandal. But when I looked at the sandal, it's basically a boot. I mean, it just doesn't let your yeah. foot move at all. And right. Yeah, it's like, okay, cool. The pain goes away if you're not using it, but that doesn't mean you've cured the thing. Exactly, so, and, I, and I get that all the time. So people, you know, they'll, they'll put a comment on the sock doc site with like a shoe that I've maybe talked poorly about. And they'll say, no, I actually wore this shoe and this got rid of my problems. I don't understand why you're talking badly about the shoe. And it's like, you don't quite understand the point here is that if that shoe is literally correcting your problem, then you should be able to not, you should not need to wear that shoe after a little while and you should be able to walk barefoot and, be, and, and move freely again. But they can't do that. They have to stay in that shoe. Because the, 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 the shoe is like an orthotic supporting some dysfunction. It's supporting right. some imbalance that they have. Well, I remember, um, so when I first got back into sprinting, I was getting injured constantly. And I don't remember how or why I got them, but I got a pair of MBT, the Maasai Barefoot Technology oh, yeah. Shoes. Yeah. And, the, and I loved them for one completely counterintuitive reason compared to how they were selling them. And that is when I was getting all these injuries, <clears throat> the biggest injury that I got was, was calf strain. And I could wear those shoes and walk without having to use my calves. I was basically just rolling over in a way right, where right. I wasn't yep. using my muscles. In fact, here's a crazy one. The Nike Vaporfly, where everyone's going, hey, this shoe is amazing. It's making people 4% faster. It's not. Um, Roger Crom here at the University of Colorado, he's been studying that shoe. And he says it's made, it gives people 4% improvement in their VO2 max, their ability to process oxygen. And then he finally conceded that there's no direct correlation between having a better VO2 max and actually how you perform. But right. he's researched to try to figure out why people are some seemingly better in that shoe. And what he's concluded most recently from what I've seen, he may have updated this since, is that um, you don't have to use your muscles as much. Is that it's allowing you to do more by just jamming into your joints without having to actually use your body the way it's supposed to be used. And sure, if you're trying to win a gold medal, that may be the way to do it. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to run when you're five years after winning that gold medal. Um, sure. But it's an, that was an amazing thing. It's like, it seems like it's working better by having you not have to use your body. It's like, oh, blah, 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 what? Yeah. You know? So, okay. Yeah. So immobilizing, basically everything that we talked about as the common treatments are some form of immobilization, which if you do have real tissue damage, that's part of it. Of course, mm -hmm. you want to get moving as quickly that's as early. you can. Yep. Yep. So what do you recommend that is not that? So, um, and, and as you alluded to earlier, you know, in the video is what I show people do at home because in my office, I'm able to muscle test each individual muscle and see where the dysfunction is and see exactly how to correct that, whether that be a manual therapy to the foot or the calf, hip, ankle, knee, whatever, um, and, and find out where those 
fascial points that need to be manipulated are. In other words, like what people might call those trigger points or those mild fascial points. So we can find out exactly where those are. And I show some of those in the videos, like the common ones on the tibialis posterior muscles and as well in the calf. Um, and aside from that, uh, at least for home therapies, after that, it's really starting to strengthen your feet, which means you know, you're doing some barefoot exercises. You're maybe doing some eccentric heel drops you know, on the stairs. So uh, describe, you're doing some, describe what that is for human beings who don't know. So basically a calf, you're, you're standing on a step or something a few inches off the ground, maybe five, six inches off the ground. You're doing a, like a, a calf raise, so your tippy toe on the end of the stairs, and then you're slowly lowering so your heels are dropping below the steps, below parallel. Do you and you're sort of getting a stretch in your calf. Do you recommend doing that or, um, uh, or doing like push up with both feet and go down with one foot? So you're really getting an actual eccentric load rather than just- Well, at first some people, I mean, eventually you want to do just one foot, absolutely. But some people can't even start with that because their feet are so bad. So I have them start uh, with two. And then, if they, and then if they can balance, okay, even if they got to hang, hang onto a handrail, ideally, yeah, you're doing it just with one leg. You're going up on the one foot, doing a knife calf, like tippy toe raise and then slowly lowering maybe five or six seconds into the heels all the way down, hold it for a second, and then pushing up quickly and lowering. So something like that. You okay. know, that's going to be more for uh, calf soleus gastroc issue. Tibialis posterior, a little bit more hard to, to isolate that muscle because it's so involved with pronation. That muscle is giantly in, or drastically intertwined between the, the two lower leg bones, your tibia and your fibula, in this membrane called your interosseous membrane, similar to what holds your radius and your ulna together here. It's a thick, you know, almost like spider web sheath of connective tissue, and your tibialis posterior is all integrated in there, and then the bottom of your foot and what we call the fascia. So to really rehab your tibialis posterior, in my opinion, you're looking at actually just moving. If you're walking, you're, you're trying to really do a nice full range of motion walk. In other words, you know, use your entire foot, the flexibility of your foot, and then, you know, work up to um, a good walk on a hard surface, as well as eventually into a, a light run, if you can do that, or even if that means running in place to actually strengthen the entire foot. Do you ever recommend one of the things, I don't remember if I got this idea from you or where I picked it up, but I, I recommend for people often uh, just uh, walking barefoot on something like gravel where they can't just walk, but they have to place their foot somewhat deliberately and they have to engage their foot to do so uh, yes. because otherwise, it, and, and it also is, it's activating the, the nervous system as well. It's not mm -hmm. just, it doesn't feel like it's just a muscular thing. It really gets your brain involved in how do I, where am I putting my foot and how am I putting my foot? And you have to keep things sort of pre-tension. Yeah, it really activates what's called that kinesthetic sense, you know, yep. like, but, and that's awesome. Unfortunately, most people, like I have, I have a, I have part of my, my, um, uh, walkway at my office is, is a, like a pea gravel, you know, yep. it's not any yeah. of the sharp stuff. Like, that's what like I was thinking like, of. yeah, but I mean that I've watched people walk on that and to, before they hit the, the hard um, paver surface. And it just overstimulates their brain like crazy. Oh, like, interesting. It's not really hurting their feet, but it's too much sensory stimulation. That's a it really interesting. Nuts. Yeah, that's a really so, interesting point. Because so, I know. So, 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 yeah. Well, I've talked about that, or I've thought about that, just when talking about going barefoot, is I, I think a lot of people confuse um, uh, either like doing too much, too much mm -hmm. too soon, and muscular issue with exactly that, that overstimulation. Like at first, when you, when you let your brain feel what's happening with your feet, it's, it feels great because like, yes, that's what I've been asking for. But if mm -hmm. you've had things so numb for so long, then yeah. there's definitely that thing of just like, whoa, whoa, chill out, which is, it, it's funny. People ask me like with our sandals with the Z Trek and the Z Trail, the Trek is just five and a half millimeters of rubber. The trail has some foam in there to give it a little extra cushion. And people ask me, you know, about the difference. And I say, if I wear the trail for a while, which has just that little bit of extra cushion and it's just, and a tiny amount, um, it just feels super smooth. And then I put on the Trek, which is basically barefoot with a layer of, of rubber between you and the ground, my brain's like, oh, right, I can feel things again. And then every now and then it's like, yeah, I need a break from that. Can you get those yes. other ones back on? And so I yeah. alternate just based on what feels like, you know, the right thing for that day. Yeah. I don't know why yeah. A, few, a, a few years ago, I, I was at a, a movement workshop out in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I was the one to lead this 5K run at like 6,000 elevation through one of the mountain ranges. It was all like gravel type trail. And I had never right. run on that before. So I did it barefoot and one other guy chose to do it barefoot too. And by the end, he actually tore up his feet bad because he wasn't used to running barefoot. It was, yeah. it was a bloody disaster. My feet didn't get nicked at all, but by basically after about two, two and a half miles, I stuck it out the whole three miles, but 
I was just, my brain was so wasted after that. That's what I felt like. Yeah. Like my feet weren't hurting, but the rest of the day I was like, I was like jacked up. Yeah. It was just so much for me to process because I wasn't used to running on that type of surface for a good 30 minutes or so. I think we, I think people forget that one of your brain's biggest functions is to uh, not pay attention to certain things. It's like weeding out things that are mm -hmm. extraneous and you really can just give yourself too much stimulation yeah. um, and need to find a way to, to, to mitigate that uh, or modulate that. And th this is the thing when, that I see often is people, they get so excited about the idea of barefoot or natural movement. They, they just, the, the too much they do, it's more about what's happening with their sensory input than it is all the muscular stuff going on. You're absolutely right. And, and, and that goes back to like what we were saying a little while ago, like how you feel in the morning, like how your feet feel in the morning will determine how uh, your overall health or a lot of it, you know, I'll say, I mean, obviously not all the time, but, and how much you can handle walking on a uncomfortable surface, like how, mm -hmm. how, how, stimu how much stimuli is that to you? That's a good indication of how sort of like, uh, you know, how much like static you have. I, I use the analogy you like if you're like one of those old school radio stations you know you're trying to find the dial right on that radio but there's so much static if you've just got so much static meaning so much stress in your life you can't handle any bit any little bit more sensory stimulation you know somebody drops a pan in the kitchen you freak out or a bright light uh you know really makes you squint like you can't handle light light uh stress you can't handle sound stress your feet are going to be even more of a reflection of your overall health so if you can't handle Forget about the hard surfaces, but you know, just that little stone under your foot or right. some gravel, some peak gravel. If that drives you nuts, your brain's already maxed out, most likely. <laughs> I also noticed, uh, in, it's not quite contrary to that, but I think it's part of a feedback loop that when I first started going barefoot, which is now 12 years ago, uh, things that were uncomfortable to walk on now are not a problem. And yeah. in part, it's because I've just gotten more familiar with how to use my feet to adapt yeah. to those things. In part, it's because I've become a little more, uh, how do I want to put it? Um, if something starts to hurt, I just step off of it rather than mm -hmm. trying to stay on it. And in part, that's because I'm walking differently. So I'm not putting so much weight on my foot immediately that I can't step off of it. But I also think that what's happened is that my feet have gotten more flexible and the reflex arc has improved. So I'm just a little more that. responsive and able to kind of just bend around things that I previously couldn't couldn't bend around. Yeah. And you know, your pressure receptors change, your chemo receptors, all these things. I just got back from a, uh, a one month or a one week, no, a one week field course in, in Southern Utah, as you know, and you know, we were in the mountains at this um, Boulder Outdoor Survival School, a great, great organization there in, in Boulder, Utah, which is a several hours south of Provo. And I, I did a, a good bit of it, or at least one day before it got too hot, barefoot. And mm -hmm. one of the guys looked at me, he's like, you know, we're working, we're working on these slick rocks where the sun's beating off the rocks, we're 6,000 feet up. And he's like, how are your feet not hurting? And it's not because I'm tougher or anything. It's just that my feet have adapted to the heat. Right. You know? And I, I stepped on a cacti and it didn't feel good, but I was able to pull the little, the little needles out of my foot without, without it being huge fun. Because I think my foot was able to move right away. Like as yeah. soon as I hit it, it can adapt and shift right away. So I'm not causing some significant damage. You know, then by the middle of the day, the sun's, you know, the, some of yeah, the sand there is way too hot. I put on my zero, right. my zero sandals, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, you're going to develop stronger, more resilient feet overall, the more you, you adapt to that. This is one of the things that, that amazes me when I talk to some people is you do present this option of natural movement and suggest that it might take some number of months till you get familiar with it, depending on yeah. where you're starting it and how your brain adapts and how your body adapts. And people, um, people are resistant to that. And I go, if you're, let's go back to putting your arm in a cast, that analogy, it's like you get your arm out of a cast, are you not gonna do physical therapy? Are you not gonna use your arm again because it's been in a cast? Or are you gonna spend some time getting it back in shape and, uh, and hopefully uh, even getting it better than it was before you started? You know, why, I, I, I'm just, I, I'm thinking about this out loud. Like, what is it about feet or, I don't know what, something about feet where people are seemingly reticent to just do the simplest thing, spend a little time barefoot, a little more every day mm -hmm. to develop lifelong strength and balance and, and sensitivity and all these things that feet provide. I, I'm, I'm just so, I don't know what it is that people just are re reluctant to do that in ways they aren't for other parts of their body. Well, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, and, and working with patients directly every day for the past, you know, many, many years is, I can say overall, people are reluctant overall for most of their body. I mean, 
<laughs> I, mean, I mean, I mean, they really are. People, people do not spend, it's, it's the last thing to, to correct. I mean, people will spend the time and the money fixing an appliance of their house or their car. I mean, our bodies, it's, it's amazing to me how people don't put the time into their bodies, actually. So yeah. even when you say something like their shoulder, yeah, most people will go to like physical therapy after a shoulder injury, a rotator cuff, you know, say repair or, or whatever. But very rarely do I see somebody truly vested in making that as good as what it was mm. or, or definitely, or I'd say stronger, almost never. Most right. people are just like, you know, I can't raise my arm like this up anymore. I want to be able to do that again like I can my other arm. They just kind of want some normalcy. They don't, they're happy with like, yeah, I just had, you know, this and I just injured this. I know I'm never going to be able to throw a ball again, but I just want to be able to, you know, put my arm over, or I want to be able to wash my hair without pain. They're, they're almost comfortable with me or mediocrity. Hmm. Uh, it's pretty sad actually that how, how little I think I see more and more every year, how people want to put time into their body. It's, it's literally because we're just too busy with other things. That I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm give you a counter argument to that because so, the way you said it actually made me realize something. One of the reasons for doing prolotherapy is because this is the way Tom Raven, my crazy prolo doc, um, described it because one of the things about healing is your body isn't designed unless you have, you get some injury, your body isn't designed to get you back into the same shape you were or better. It's designed to get you good enough so that you can get moving again as soon as possible. So you can get out of whatever situation has caused a problem. So we're not, I, I don't think we're physio physiologically designed to get back to the status quo, let alone to get better. And so I think what both of us are really describing is just a, mm, a slightly more intellectualized version of that same thing that yeah. that what the body's going to do naturally, just the tissue itself. It's not, I mean, this is why we develop scar tissue is yeah. we're not going to get back to where we were or better. It's just going to do just good enough. And I think what we're talking about is the psychological version of just good enough. Yeah, I think you're right. Which is kind of a shame. I mean, the only, the thing that, that you can do to, to combat that is obviously if you're, if you, your livelihood is dependent on being in shape or getting better, or if you've got some other thing that shows up as a, uh, a motivation for doing it. But I think what we're talking about in similar to critical thinking, we're not wired for doing critical thinking. I think we may not be wired for doing critical healing, if you will, uh, which, which now makes me think of, you know, what can we do to, to tweak that? How can we turn that into a game? How can we do something where, where we can, make an end run around some natural process that might not be as effective or as efficacious as we would like. I have no idea where that's going, uh, but it's just, it, it's suddenly seeming like an interesting line of inquiry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so, so anything else that you want to think of about natural movement? And I'm going to say, uh, uh, as I asked that question, I'm, I'm going to give it a caveat. Um, what are you seeing as the kind of the trajectory of this whole concept of natural movement in particular and, and when it applies to running and walking more specifically? I have my perspective from what I'm seeing on the footwear side. I'm curious what you're seeing on your side, both as a practitioner, as someone who's been involved in this whole conversation for a long mm -hmm. time as well. Sorry, I, I kind of lost the actual That's okay. Point. I did too. Okay. Um, I guess the question is, I'll say it this way. So, Many people think that the whole barefoot running thing died, and yeah. which is completely patently false. And we see it, uh, or our evidence that that's false is just the fact that our company has just grown significantly year after year after year after year, and people right. are asking for more and more products uh, uh, that uh, that accomplish different things. That we have so many customers who own multiple pairs of our of our products for different activities, um, and it, then when we go to Europe, where there wasn't this whole argument about barefoot or natural movement. It's just been a part of the culture for a long time. Same thing yeah. in Asia. We're, we're seeing that uh, the United States is its own peculiar little thing. But we're also seeing that some of the bigger companies are starting to try and do a little more of what we're doing. They're not actually getting to what we're doing or anything close to it, but they're trying to use the same language. They're using some of the same similar design ideas that yes. aren't applied well enough. So I'm seeing that it's starting to become a thing, that my whole idea of making natural movement, that obviously choice like natural food may have some real merit to it but i'm wondering yes, okay. what you know what your perspective is we haven't talked about this what you see both uh in your practice and just you know however you're observing reality around you yeah i mean i think i think people are putting that more into their everyday movement where before you know 
as a, you know, coming from a running background, a triathlete background, you know, I, I probably only talk about cross training before, you know, like I'm going to do different sporting activities where today you're going to get more athletes doing different types of almost like play movements. You know, they're going to, you know, like a, like adult games, you know, you're going to go out maybe even if it's, um, you know, running around on the, on the front yard and playing tag with your kids or some sort of natural movement that's using different types of, uh, you know, muscular connections or fascial connections or, you know, something different than what you're used to doing and hopefully doing that barefoot. So I do agree with you that, yeah, it, it's, it's more, it's more talked about every year. Um, but I, I got to say, and, and this isn't counter to what you're saying at all, but unfortunately what I see, and maybe it's because of where I live in the hustle and bustle triangle, you know, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill here in North Carolina is that, Unfortunately, it's still uh, it's still not on people's priority lists. Right. You know that it's their last thing when their health, unfortunately, is still coming last. And and, and exercise or training or activity, whatever word you want to use, play, um, is still unfortunately not on the top of their list. Eating to, eating is important. You know, they're like, oh, I'm going to go to Whole Foods or I'm going to go to the health food <laughs> store and get this yeah. or. Or, you know, they're still going and they're, they're like, got to get in their 30 minutes on the treadmill or the dreaded elliptical, which I think is the worst machine ever developed. Uh, Wait, hold on, hold on. Why? Because it's so unnatural. Like, <laughs> like, like the, the elliptical is the exact opposite of natural movement. I, I really think, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I think the elliptical was made because people can't, could never do cross-country skiing, the NordaTrack machine. <laughs> which, re- which is which is a natural movement to some degree and required coordination. That the it does require coordination. No man. The, the, ellipti- I- the, the elliptical you can just stand mindlessly on and move your arms and legs in some ununiform fashion to get your heart rate up. So uh, I am so anti elliptical. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Anyhow. Well. Do you have one in that? Do, you, do we need to turn the camera? No, 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 no. I don't have an elliptical. In fact, um, uh, we're, we're getting a, a true form treadmill in here. So one of the curved treadmills. I, those are great. Those, yeah. are, those are different, but it's because it's, it's a true running form. Yeah, but exactly. anyway, I, I mean, so, so I, I still see people, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I still see that that's not on the, the, the huge priority in people's life, even though they're aware of it where, right. and, and, and I hope it's going to change because you know, growing up in this, you know, being in the business now for 20 plus years, you know, I can say even 10 years ago, people like, oh yeah, I I know about hydrogenated fats. I know how bad they are, but they would still eat them. Or I know how bad corn syrup is, but I still eat them. Where now I don't see that today. I almost never have to talk to my patients about high fructose corn syrup or hydrogenated fats. I'm hoping in another few years, five years, that they're going to come in and more people are going to say to me, hey, yeah, you know, I'm doing this, this fun activity or I'm doing this movement activity more so than it's only happening because I'm recommending it, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, unfortunately, I, I don't see any patients who come in. I see patients who wear your shoes and other minimalist company shoes, which is nice, but very rarely. And I could say out of all my patients over the years, I might, I'd like to say one or two are actually truly barefoot like me. Right. You know? Well, like you. You know, we're, look, admittedly, we're freaks. Um, yeah. And uh, one day. But, 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 you know, we also, we also, are true to what we believe in. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, especially you. I mean, I'll plug you for a minute. Here you are. You sell shoes. That's your living. How often do you wear shoes during the day? Some days you don't even put shoes on. Most days, yeah. Most days you don't even wear shoes. So you don't even wear your own product because you understand that really the best is to wear well, no shoes. Well, this is what I've said since day one is barefoot is best. And when it's not yeah. appropriate, that's why we have zero shoes. There and, you go. and so when I'm on the track on the weekends, I do most all my warm ups and drills barefoot. And then mm-hmm. when it's time to do speed, I'm in our shoes. Right. And uh, when I'm, when else do I wear shoes? Um, if it's exceedingly hot out, and I know I have to spend a lot of time on, on, um, not asphalt. concrete, yeah, on asphalt, yeah. Um, or or you got to go into a store or something and you don't want someone mo- yelling at you. Mo- m- most stores I have no problem with. The only store that I have a problem with, Whole Foods. Whole Foods, yeah. Yeah, Whole Foods. Grocery stores. Ha- whole- yeah. No, not grocery stores. I go into oh, really? King-, King Supers at our regular grocery store. Never. Okay. Ha- the only thing anyone's ever said to me is, that looks cool. And uh, Whole Foods, the number of times people have said, yeah, you can't do that here. And I go, why? I go, well, it's an insurance thing. I said, no, actually, it's not. They go, well, it's a, it's a health uh, care or um, what's the word? Health code thing. I go, no, actually, it's not. It's, a, it's <laughs> for employees. You have to wear shoes, but it's right. nowhere about patrons. But they have a sign that says, you know, that you have to wear shoes. And I go, well, how come it's okay to have dogs in here barefoot? Why, why, is, why is that all right? They go, yeah. well, uh, uh, so they, they've gotten mad at me. Um, I was in Costco once wearing shoes because I'd just gotten off the track. And some, one of the employees stopped me and said, is everything okay? 
I said, no, why? Because you're, you're wearing shoes. I went, it's okay, they're mine. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, but, yeah. but uh, in fact, I was in the it, hospital. It, 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 it is funny how you get that. Like I was recently at one of my patient's funerals. <laughs> uh, no joke, up in Virginia. And the family came up to me after, thank you for coming, all this. And they were like, we didn't, you know, then they gave me the smart ass kind of, we didn't recognize you. You're wearing shoes at right. the funeral. And I'm like, I thought, I thought shoes were appropriate at the funeral, you know? Check, check this one out. So when my dad died, I think it was about four years ago. Um, I can't remember if it was three years or four years. Let's call it four years ago. My dad dies and uh, I, I had a, um, a dress shoe from another minimalist company mm -hmm. and cause we weren't making one and they didn't fit my feet. I mean, they hurt like crap. And so I took them off as quickly as I could. And the rabbi comes up to me and he says, you know, in Orthodox uh, families, the family doesn't wear shoes while they're mourning the loss of really? whoever it is, because it's one of the signs. You don't look in a mirror, you don't wear shoes. And I went, Oh, I'm in. And so for the rest of the, the, rest of the, the couple of weeks, I wasn't wearing shoes. And we're not an Orthodox Jewish family, but I just, you know, took that yeah. as a, something I could do. And yeah, I'm, but the thing, Irene Davis made, made a comment, um, Irene's from Harvard, and she, you know this, of course. Um, Irene said, if we just get kids in natural movement footwear for when they need footwear, in 20 years, we won't have to treat them for the problems that adults currently have. And it may be that what we're talking about is a hopefully not multi-generational issue where this does become the obvious choice. And we we start seeing barefoot as a more acceptable thing. I mean, look, I'm the first to admit it, that I'm still, uh, that I'm occasionally self-conscious about it when I'm going into certain places barefoot and I'm waiting for someone to say something. And um, one day I'm walking into the office and I'm dressed like I am now. I'm in, you know, a pair of shorts. I've got a zero shoes t-shirt. My hair was uh, unnaturally big that day and uh, I'm bare feet and I catch my reflection in the window and I just stop and I went, oh, I'm that guy. Okay. There you are. You are that guy. Yeah. I, I was not aware of that. <laughs> uh, and part of it is from being 57 too. I mean, so, you know, being, being an old guy walking around like this, uh, that, that adds to it as well. And I, I kind of yeah. enjoy that. I'm okay getting crazier as I get older. Mm -hmm. There you go. Because they, they give you more, they cut you more slack. So um, anything you can think of before we call it a whatever day, morning, evening, afternoon, this happens no. to you? No. I mean, geez, right. it's always, you and I could talk well, forever. It's always fun. It is, so if people want to find out more about what you're up to and what you're doing and just, just what you've been sharing and teaching, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, well, my website's unfortunately I haven't updated for a long time, but you got sockdoc.com. So that, that's OCK-DOC.com. And then my other site, drdanjemi.com, D-R-G-A-N-G-E-M-I. And, uh, and then for practitioners out there, those who are interested in manual therapy techniques, I have my whole um, line of work in videos and manuals, and that's systems healthcare. That's the technique that I developed, systemshealthcare.com. Awesome. And you can find those all online. Beautiful. And we'll link to them as well. So first of all, thank you again. As you said, you. always a pleasure, totally a treat. Um, and for everyone else, thank you for being part of this episode of the Movement Movement Podcast. If you want to hear the other episodes, head over to jointhemovementmovement.com. If you have any questions or comments or somebody you want to recommend for being on the show, uh, drop an email to move at jointhemovementmovement.com. And again, uh, remember to subscribe and like and share and do all those things to, to uh, say thanks and to pass on the word. And as I like to say, if you want to be part of the tribe, please subscribe. Always a pleasure to have you here. And as always, live life feet first. Take care.